Welcome to the unit one full overview video. In fact, showing the website here and uh, you can see the videos right up top. Also student calendar as a starting point for making uh, a student calendar on your own class website. Then here we have the overview, you know, the unit about four weeks, the performance expectations. Unit one doesn't have technically any performance expectations. However, I want to point out that this unit is really taking students and giving them time on task of one of the biggest ideas in physics. What's bigger than Newton's laws, conservation of energy? The idea that physicists, this is like pure physics, we can look at a system, any system, and collect data, look for a pattern, create a mathematical model a mathematical function that acts the same way as the system, which allows us to better understand that system and predict its future behavior. And then also so many science practices. We just know students don't always come into our classrooms, having all of those not ready for uh, completing a performance expectation in the first few weeks of school. Then also over here, you can see many assessment opportunities that could be formative or summative as uh, you see the need for. Just want to point out three quizzes, a full formal lab report, the option for a test or the patterns in your life that I'll circle back to. Here, if we keep scrolling down, we get the storyline learning progression. And so here, how do we find and use patterns in nature to predict the future, make data informed decisions in the present and understand the past. And so we are going to do that experiment after experiment after experiment after experiment. All right, and these four experiments give students anchoring experiences, go-to touchstone experiences with the four most common patterns we see in introductory physics, really even through college introductory physics. And that is the pendulum to give us a horizontal line, rolling a ball on a floor to get the proportional relationship, put those two together, you actually get linear. Then we have the, uh, packing tomatoes with marbles to get the quadratic pattern, and then resizing paragraphs. And that might surprise you, but I'll try to convince you that that's a great touchstone experiment for students for the inversely proportional pattern. And then you can see this little image down here, which kind of shows that after we establish these anchoring experiments, we can spiral back to them again and again and build competency. So really this is exposure. Then we go to practice and mastery. So they do not need to master all four of these patterns. That will come throughout the year as they have time on task and build competency with them. So don't need to add extra homework, extra lectures. Really, we wanna keep the eyes on the prize. We wanna make sure to get to unit six, climate change and electric guitars. So this is an exposure. Now, day one has a fun, most of the good stuff all in one Day. So that is the inquiry cube. So I will uh, switch over to the slides just to show you. So right here we had um, an overview of the whole unit. Then you can see we have a dive into each task in the unit. And then the slides give us almost a minute by minute uh, accounting of the activity structure. All right. So there's that storyline. I just want to point out that the inquiry cube generates this essential question. So that comes right out out of the activity structure. So if you look at the slides, you'll see that. But again, how do we find and use patterns in nature to predict the future, make data informed decisions in the present and understand the past? That is a essential question that we use throughout the whole science sequence, physics, chemistry, biology. All right, and then to make it fun, you know, here's just a Photoshopped image that has these uh, cubes and there is a teacher cube that could be have the full thing. And then there are smaller individual cubes that you can give each student group that doesn't have everything on the bottom, just in case they pick it up. You don't want it to spoil the surprise. We want them to have to look and collect data on the sides that they can see, and they're not allowed to touch it. So if they can't see the other side, they got to ask a student, what do you see on your side? And that's just analogous to real scientists that might have access to different equipment or perspectives. So through that real light touch, they already end this with a claim about what they think's on the bottom. 
And if you want to keep it simple here, you can see in the notes, you can have them predict just what color is going to be on the bottom or the lower right number. If they want more of a challenge, they can go for it and try to predict the name that's on the bottom. But in any case, we'll want them to make a claim, say what data they're using to support that, and then walk us through how does that data support their claim reasoning. All right. The other thing is um, there's a beautiful conference in the middle so that they're sharing each of their thoughts, learning from each other. And that all goes together to build our making better predictions using inquiry arrow. And so they've gone through this in one day. They had a wild guess at the beginning, that inquiry to determine the pattern and then make sense of the pattern through consensus. That's that research conference. And then they make a data informed prediction and they live the experience that that data informed is much better than a wild guess. There is value in evidence-based reasoning and they just lived it. All right, so moving on. All right, so here going to our anchoring experience with the horizontal line. So I'll quick show that horizontal line. And we made these posters with math teachers so that it has all the things that they want to. But there's one other thing this experiment does. So, you know, it doesn't matter what angle you release as long as that angle is pretty small, but uh, it takes about the same amount of time every time. However, there's one other thing. We have all students participate in a single pendulum. And I really want to say that. Um, sometimes teachers have students in small groups do this and they get really noisy data and it's really hard. It's really hard to make sense. You need to be an expert scientist to make sense of noisy data. So here is a chance for you. It ends up being really fun because every student has data to collect. And it also really shows that students taking data on the same exact thing get different numbers. And so there is a range in the data set. And that is great because we want them to realize that. And so from middle school, they already know you should put a dot at the average, but we want to ramp that up and say, look, yes, the dot's at an average, but there is some uncertainty. We're not sure it's exactly the average. And so there's some uncertainty in the time as shown by how many different students uh, got different times. And then also there's an uncertainty in the angle, this one, this angle might be a little big, but uh, in any case, I have a very small protractor and it's hard to read. So plus or minus a few degrees on the protractor and plus or minus a few tenths of a second in time. And so students really get this uncertainty boxes, technically error bars, but you have it in both the X and Y direction. So it traces out a box, uncertainty box. Excellent, so I'm going to then um, just say how we finish up. So the conclusion, there's a, there's a vertical articulation in the conclusion writing. Conclusion writing is something we want to get them to mastery by the fourth labs. Four weeks in, they can with lab after lab after lab after lab, move through exposure practice and mastery. And you can see it's a light touch. It's a really fill in the blank. Click, click. After investigating the behavior of um, a weighted mass at the end of a string, I conclude there is a horizontal line relationship between the angle it was released and the time it took to swing. All right, so moving along, horizontal line anchoring experiment. A month later, we can refer back to that. I still have, I keep a pendulum up most of the year and we can just do that. And of course this will cycle back with conservation of energy, uh, conservation of momentum, excellent. Then we move on to our anchoring experience for, with proportional, and that's rolling a ball on the floor. Classic physics happens in almost every physics class, and for good reason. It's very intuitive. It's understandable. It really is a chance to be successful with proportional, which shows up so much in introductory physics. Now, to make it a little bit fun, we have them wild guess, just like the inquiry cube, wild guess, how far is this bowling ball going to roll? And then we actually only allow them to take data with ball bearings. So there's multiple levels of inquiry. We're packing a lot in here. But in any case, they can tell from a small, medium, and little ball that when they roll them down, they all end up going the same speed at the bottom. So mass 
is a horizontal line. So they can use that data to predict for the bowling ball. The other piece of that puzzle is there's two different ramp heights going on in different groups have different ones. So they can see that different ramp heights lead to different velocities on the ground. And that's no surprise. They know that a tall, steep ramp is gonna launch that ball faster. Okay, with that said, um, actually I'm going to go into that and say, here is another resource. I'm gonna show the, the resources that you have for a data discussion. I'm spreading them out over all four labs during this video, but you could use every resource on every data discussion. So these are the slides. So on the first data discussion, that might be a whole class one. They might need a lot of guidance and checks with you, but here's the big ideas. First, we gotta make sure we have quality data. If you have someone that took really erroneous data that is very hard for students to make sense of that and it's just confusing. So you might be careful about sharing uh, low quality data. Then orient to the data. Some we just gotta look at it and understand what is really going on, right? Know what's on the axes, pick a couple data points, read them off. No surprise, look for similarities and differences. We just saw that like, oh, a difference. Different ramp heights in the real world had graphs show up differently. No surprise that the steep ramp had a steep graph. Now, sometimes they think, oh, that means that the ramp, the slope was the ramp height, but no, let's actually finish and go to the mathematical model. So steep ramps also have a difference in their mathematical model. They have a bigger number. So students lots of times do think that's like the slope of the ramp, not the slope of the line. And we want, you know, we want to say we took data with the ball on the floor. So what does the ball on the floor have? because it came down a steep ramp of uh, velocity. So every student is successful and they can make sense of the pattern in light of the different experiments that are going on. And then just one more slide to show you that sometimes students will just find a similarity in one part of the triangle, but once they find it in one, we wanna use that to walk the whole triangle. So if they notice that the mathematical model has different numbers in its constant, Oh, that shows up. Ah, it shows up that the bigger number had the steeper slope on the graph. So we can find similarities for each point in the triangle and then differences we already talked about. So we could also say, hey, hey launch a discussion using the same input. At one second, how far was your ball? Oh, one meter. At one second, how far was yours? Two and a half meters. Whoa. Okay. So what was different? You must've had a high ramp. Yeah, I did actually. Oh, I bet your mathematical model has a big number. Yep. So you can just see lots of light touches, easy to engage questions right there. And I'm going to show many more, but I do want to step back and uh, move on. This is actually a three day, three 90 minute period activity. So a week in an AB schedule for us. So there's a lot in here. We're building a lot. So I'm hoping you're seeing unit one is rigorous. All right. So the other thing that's pretty clear that students start to get is, hey, you know, I got to make a prediction for six seconds. We only took data for like one or two seconds. And they start realizing, hey, if I took data here and I predict for within that data set, oh, I'm going to have high confidence. But if you have to predict further than you ever tested, your confidence is probably going to go down. And if it's really far, every student knows friction is going to um, eventually slow down that ball. So they can just really intuitively understand that their confidence using the mathematical model is going to start to um, get lower and lower. The other thing, the, another important piece of that puzzle is if you had dead on data, well, then your prediction is probably going to be dead on, at least within the data range. And then, of course, as you go further and further, we've already talked about. But if you have noisy data, well, then the line's probably going to predict noise as well a little bit. And of course, as you roll that ball further and further and friction becomes uh, too big to ignore or the ball hits a wall, all bets are off, right? Like that uh, mathematical model is not going to correctly predict where that ball is if it hits a wall. So that's that last column. Students really intuitively find this, and this is really important because it allows them to justify their confidence in their predictions. And we really want that. This is all about evidence-based reasoning and then justifying what level of confidence you have in those predictions. It's not as simple as uh, the formula calculated this, therefore that's the right answer. It's more nuanced than that. And we wanna to start to expose students to that.
All right, so I mentioned that the conclusion has a vertical articulation. So the conclusion writing this time is actually a card sort. So we give them three conclusions, a high quality, a medium quality, and a low quality. And all the sentences are cut up and mixed together. So each time they pull out a sentence, they got to talk about which part of the conclusion is that sentence. And then is that part of the low quality, medium quality, or high quality? And this is really important because it's a time on task tell element. This really focuses them. Sometimes writing takes a lot of time and a lot of encouragement. This task is focused on what makes something go from low quality to medium quality. What's the real difference in medium quality to high quality? So all of the time here is not trying to get students to write, but is on what it makes a good conclusion. And then this one finishes up in a really fun way. Again, just like the inquiry cube, we want them to live the experience of evidence-based reasoning. So this wild guess, I roughly have half my class stand where their wild guess was. That's like five to 20 feet at the most. And this ball rolls like 60 feet. So uh, half the class stands at the wild guess and they're on one side of the tape measure. And then the rest of the class stands at the data informed prediction. And it is just visual. That ball in the first couple seconds rolls past every wild guess. And so this is why we do science. This is what data-informed predictions get you, evidence-based reasoning. Wild guesses, maybe someone got lucky and got somewhat close within like five or 10 feet. But really, the data-informed, they're within an inch or two. So students see it. They live it, that there is value in doing the process of science. Now, one more piece, and this is just a nice touch. You can just see how, hopefully, how packed this is, that students do know that that mathematical model is not going to work. And so sometimes um, students will say, like, why would we ever use something in an equation that we know doesn't work all the time? It's wrong. And we want to teach them that. And I think I'll jump over to chemistry because it's just really simple, that we want to use the simplest model that gets us the correct answer. If you want to understand why blowing into a balloon makes it expand or why two hydrogen go with oxygen, you want the Dalton model or the Bohr model. You do not want to be dealing with quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanical model of an atom to answer those kind of questions. That would be too laborious. It would be too hard. It'd just be too hard. So we want to teach them the nuance that simple models have value if they have predictive value. So we want to use the simplest model that gets you the right answer. And a warning, this is difficult when you don't know what the right answer is. Like that friction, we, we didn't know when friction would become important, but after their data, they can start to already get a hunch at, okay, um, that bowling ball wasn't slowed down much at all. I mean, it really isn't. Even after 60 feet, if you have a nice uh, hard surface, that bowling ball is still really close, but you can imagine, you know, obviously 300 feet later, that bowling ball friction would. So it shows you that with science, once you generate a mathematical model, you still have to think. And we want to do it in a way that students can be successful. And that bowling ball is that. So that establishes the proportional pattern. All right, then moving into our light touch. Is this cat going up or down? And I don't want you to look at it too long because I just, you're kind of pulled in. Is that going up or down? And students are too. And like, it's pretty easy to get them to vote. And that can just be thumbs up, thumbs down. And just show that this is the introduction to claim evidence reasoning. Technically, they had a light touch even with the inquiry cube. Uh, but here we go. We're ramping it up a little bit. And this uh, inquiry cube could have been group. And this is individual. So then they write a claim. And in the slides, there's many supports and your guidance. They can write a claim for up or down the evidence, share between each other that consensus. And they, most of the time, most of the class does go one direction once you look at that more carefully and you start to hear the reasoning. And then, yeah, wrap it up. So that is just a light touch. And I'll, once we get to the assessments, you'll see that they are assessed you know, in GSS in one sentence, use the big ideas of science to explain phenomena and solve problems. So we want them using claim evidence reasoning to use the big ideas of science to explain phenomena. So we need some practice with that. All right, so I'm gonna jump back to the slides and move on, whoops, to our third foundational experiment. And this is uh, really 
important. So this is around packing tomatoes. Now we'll get to marbles here in a second. And this is a phenomenon you can go as deep or as shallow as you want. I'll just say that um, if, if you go right to marbles, sometimes students are like, oh, we're doing a study in marbles. So we really do. This is a real phenomena that efficiently packing food from where it's grown to where it's shipped can reduce its carbon footprint. And so you can go further with this, but for the sake of the video, I'm going to just leave it at that. So now packing tomatoes, um, you know, it'd be wasteful. And so all students know that we shouldn't really use tomatoes. So we're going to find something else. And obviously, especially with what's in the classroom, it's going to make sense to switch the ball bearings. And we do that all the time in science. In unit four, we'll see where they study basketball players. And it's very hard to study basketball players while they're playing basketball moving around and you can't get your scientific equipment in there so you put them on a treadmill it, this is like for the volume vo2 max the how much oxygen they're using and so you got to put them on a treadmill and you put a, a, a tube up to their mouth and so you can capture all the air they're breathing in and breathing out that is an analogous system of study we do it all the time if you're studying a disease you might grow that bacteria in a cultural a petri dish so we oftentimes recreate a system, an analogous system, that's something like the real system. And that's a good question. How much does our analogous system mimic the real system we're studying? So just showing how much there is in each of um, these. You know, These are things students can get pulled into and discuss. And these are high level things on just the first and second week of school, really thoughtful stuff. All right. so. You can imagine they take data, want to show a new resource, an additional resource that you can be using. So we really do want to get to smaller groups. Now, very unlikely you're going to stay in a small group the whole time. Eventually, enough groups are going to need um, have questions. You're going to probably have to pull everyone together. But how to keep them in the smaller groups successfully for a little bit longer? Each group could have a facilitator, and you could give them these cards for leading data discussions. I'm just going to pop over to the... Uh, teacher calendar to just show. So here's an example. Here's the packing tomatoes. You know, here's the slides. And then uh, card sort, which I'm about to show later in 10 seconds or so. And then here's the student talk prompts that I was just showing right there. So let me actually show the prompts. So on similarities and differences, at, you know, that leader could ask each student to find a similarity and prepare for a whip around, a rapid fire quick answer. Because we're really trying to get every student talking. And rather than just one student talking at a time, we really want five, 10 students talking at a time. So we need that smaller group and we need them to be successful. So here is a support to help them with that. Now, this is only the third experiment. So you might be whole, somewhere between small group and whole class. All right, but then making sense, again, ask each student to state or restate the common pattern. And so that's there. And now I do wanna show that card sort. So in addition, the graphic organizer, which I didn't even show because I'm going to show that in the next one, there is something in the packet that lead them through the data discussion as well, is these get cut up and all scrambled. And so you got the large marble. And this one always surprises everyone who, if you haven't thought about it yet, surprised me too, is that the large marble you kind of think is going to go with the large number, the large constant or coefficient. However, that coefficient is not size, it's actually packability, how packable. So the small marble, like a cherry tomato, you can pack a lot of cherry tomatoes into a small area. So it actually has a big number here. So large marbles, it's gonna be this low, low number and low curvature here. With five, you're only gonna get like 10 of them in big, is gonna get filled up right away. But cherry tomatoes, you might get 25 cherry tomatoes in the same size container. And this card sort really makes that accessible for students to reason about. Now they will need teacher guidance though. So um, again, minimum help for them to be successful. All right, so move, keeping it going, uh, that establishes our quadratic pattern. And just, I don't have my foldable here, but uh, there's a picture in the slides. Quadratic, it's so obvious. We kind of throw them off a little bit with talking about tomatoes and, and circles. But at the end of the day, you can see that if you double the diameter of the container, it gets twice as wide and twice as tall. So it doubling 
the diameter, quadruples the marbles that fit. And what do we call that pattern when you double the input, the output quadruples? Quadratic. It's really nice. Exposure. We're not asking them to solve the quadratic equation or anything like that. Every student can get the big idea that there are things in this world, like packing tomatoes, that when the diameter gets twice as wide, it also gets twice as tall. So four times or quadruple the output. And that goes by the understandable name, quadratic pattern function. Excellent. All right. So our last anchoring experiment is the paragraph. And I want to show you that, remember, it might be a month before they see inversely proportional again. So we want experiments where they end up going, oh, I should have known. And no one knows. At the beginning, they do not predict. They all think negative linear. All right. But again, we have a phenomena every time. And you can spend a little time with this. You can look at websites, uh, the science section of the newspaper, and just they see that they're, oh, yeah, you know, at different times, you got to reshape font and move it around. So pretty understandable question. You know, just let's be scientists here. Let's be physicists. Let's look at a system, take some data, find a pattern and predict it and better understand it. I think you will come to better understand paragraphs and the inversely proportional function as you look at this. So they do. And what's really neat of walking the triangle, it really comes together when they actually cut out the paragraphs and put them on one-to-one -one graph paper, it is so cool. So we got these real paragraphs and you can just see that they have wider and wider. And the actual data point, if you put the lower left at the origin, the upper right of the paragraph is the data point that goes on the graph. So what a connection between the real world and the graphical representation. They can very intuitively see that if you used big font, for your paragraph, these are all, all of these paragraphs are the exact same paragraph in terms of what they say, but this has a large size font and no surprise, its curve is further from the origin. And no surprise, it has a big number, 82. And every student gets that, that's intuitive to them. Yes, the big number is gonna be further from the origin because that's a paragraph that's just bigger. It has big font. And a tiny paragraph, that's this black line, tiny font paragraphs are going to be nestled in close to the origin. And no surprise, they have a small number in their mathematical model. So students get that, and they eventually, sometimes they think it's the words, but look, these two have the same number of words, but this purple has a bigger number. Oh, it's the size, the area. So what did we really do? We just found that height times width equals area. Oh, I should have known. Yes, and that way, every time we come back to inversely proportional, they got the angry experiment. They're not scared of that mathematical equation. So no surprise, if, take paper. If I make this paper twice as wide, by the laws of nature, it has to get twice as short. If I make it four times as wide, it has to get four times as short. Every student gets that when we're talking about paper. If you try doing circuits, they're going to not always remember that and not have such an intuitive feel for doubling the resistance, may the current do something. They kind of forget that. Okay. We want them to say those things over and over. So I want to show the um, graphic organizer that I said. So we have a graphic organizer for the data discussion. It just brings them through similarities, differences, making them some predictions with the graph and the equation. All right. And then they talk, they walk the triangle in the mathematical model. How did that constant show up in the math? Oh, it was the number 82 and 34. In the graph, the bigger the number, the further from the origin it was. In the real world, that bigger number represented a bigger paragraph by font, not by words. And then write out the equation, height equals area divided by width. Okay, and then here is a graphic organizer, another level support for the conclusion tied right in to the data discussion. So just bringing it all together, synthesizing it, you know, what, you know, which pattern inversely proportional and they show it with two data points, explain why it makes sense. I want to go back. They've explained this multiple times. Oh, it makes sense that it's pr inversely proportional because if you have a paragraph, if you move the words from the bottom to the right, 
making it twice as wide, it's going to get twice as short. Those words always take up a certain amount of spot um, size on the page. It doesn't matter if they're on the bottom or on the side. But in any case, the area will always stay the same. But doubling the width will have the height. And we just want it said multiple ways and like five, 10 different ways. Even if people repeat, it's just really good. Makes everyone chance to contribute. And then they also can write the most difficult sentence. Sometimes people want to skip this because this is the most difficult sentence because it really means you have to have real understanding. And if you spend some time in the data discussion, students can get there. And then of course, again, you're just seeing so many things spiral. Yes, let's predict. If our essential question is find patterns and predict the future, predict if we print this pattern 30 centimeters, this paragraph 30 centimeters wide, how tall will it be? justify your prediction. We don't like bald predictions. I think this is going to happen, but how much confidence do you have? So we can get students with a confidence matrix to justify their confidence. And then always important, we want to, you know, the value of science education is so students experience evidence-based reasoning. Let's have them explicitly talk about that. You know, how did you feel about using the pathway to better predictions? All right, then let's, we haven't talked about assessment yet. So really exposure practice mastery. Now we're getting into some of the first assessments. Sometimes people use quizzes on the first uh, couple labs as a uh, summative. It could be formative. It, it depends on where, if your students really are at mastery and ready to be assessed. But I do wanna just show a peek um, at an assessment. So here we have the quiz on inversely proportional and this is later in the unit. So we actually do want them um, talking about clearly explain why in science we almost prefer we almost always prefer a data informed prediction over a wild guess that um, you think is obvious and I think after this course it is but that isn't always obvious to students so this is a really important thing to check in and assess on and then of course can they contrast proportional and inversely proportional patterns then this next set follows the same as the first three. And that's always, can you read a graph? Can you reason using a graph and the equation? Can you um, apply and justify the confidence you should have? And then as we said, they're claim evidence reasoning, you know, baby steps, but this one's more straightforward, but again, it, it can, um, it's a lot of pieces for students to put together. Which of these is the large font and which is the small font? Claim evidence reasoning. And again, just that marble lab had the big one, had the smaller uh, number. And so in any case, this is a nice little assessment to see if students really are connecting the points of the triangle. All right, so I do wanna zoom out and talk about some larger assessment and I'm going to actually jump into the recommended assessment. And so I'm going to jump back patterns in your life. If we really want students to take what they're learning and apply it to their life, well, then we should have that be part of their learning in class. So here's a open-ended one. And in fact, the real feedback we get is, you know, it's hard to manage student choice that students could be going in a lot of different directions. So I actually want to talk about how you can make this um, really student choice oriented, but make it manageable. So the first, well, let me actually do the overview. They playfully brainstorm. Then they do eventually find some data and visualize the data with a graph and then reflect on it. Thoughts, wonderings, and conclusion. Here is an example from a student. So I want to just say, this is probably the most important one and students aren't, oh, they all have different answers, but it's a it, it's more straightforward to assess them. And this is, can you generate questions about how patterns or collecting data in your own life could lead to it at the personal level? So how does the amount of physical activity affect your productivity? You know, that's very straightforward. And so um, they have to come up with three of those at the personal level. And then we want them to think, pick one of those and just think about how you could actually collect real data on that. And this is a skill that students do not have, right? They have not 
designed a lot. They haven't created a lot of questions. In fact, even in this unit, we needed them to explore very particular questions. So we got to give them practice, exposure, practice, mastery at thinking of questions and thinking about how to design a lab so that when we do do it, they design a lab well enough that they can get good data because it, it's very difficult that if they design a lab and then the data comes out poorly, then they have a very hard time um, coming applying the rest of the scientific process to data they just don't understand. All right, and then zooming forward, what are the things in your community that you may be thinking is interesting to investigate? And this is a real chance for social justice, climate justice. Um, there's a lot of different directions students could follow if they have a personal passion. So again, they have three, the student just had two. And then again, where, what kind of data, what is it an experiment or could you find data somewhere? And then very similar, this next one is just going global with it though. What are some things on the global scale that you could do? And I wanna jump down to another student and show one more student down. And they the previous two students deleted this, but I just wanna show that there is, well, they could do a FET, but what's going on in this graph? And this is a great site. This is actually done, uh, created by a high school math teacher. And they just took graphs from news articles and they kind of stripped the context and put it in front of students. So chance for social justice, 28 uh, graphs about inequality, you know, teen behaviors. Those are always interesting to teens. So um, they look at those graphs and we want them thinking about it. What are questions you could answer? Uh, so I just to complete this and start to wrap this up, the data and graph, we at, they, they can get graphs from that New York Times or some other source. The New York Times is the one that makes it very manageable. You could do this in um, a single class period, 90 minute class period, maybe it's two class periods. Um, we just ask that they re-visualize. They take the data and redo it. So there's a tutorial how to turn it into a pie chart, a bar chart, or get some practice with Desmos and putting it in there. And then here is that thoughts, wonderings, and conclusion. And so, you know, inquiry often leads to more questions and wondering. So we want them to live that and, and think about that. So this is the one that they do. And it turns out to be really cool. It, it's a great, it feels very authentic to the goals we have for students. All right, with that, I'm gonna start to wrap up and bring us back to the website and just scroll down to show a little bit of what I talked about and where it's on the teacher calendar. So again, here's all the units for the whole year, the videos that we're doing right now, student calendar, the kind of in one visual, the whole unit. And then this is the deeper dive into the task level with the narratives. And then the slides get even minute by minute. We already talked about that. So each of them have the slides. So we have the pendulum experiment, uh, the ball on floor. Again, here's those prompts and card sort for that. Even though I showed it for the tomato, they're there for all of them. Um, then paragraph, you can see there's lots of narration that complements this video. So there's even more. So, you know, this is complex three-dimensional learning. So there's a lot of nuance and things. Something I didn't even mention, but I want to point out there are supports. There's five levels of support for that conclusion writing. And level zero means that students all have it. So we call it level zero. Technically, the support one, the graphic organizer is part of the packet. So that is level zero, but that is going to fade away. That, it, that actually stays for two more labs. And then it's going to become a support. We want the least amount of support for students to be successful. And so we want to move students off of that uh, in like a month or two months. So, and some students will need it longer. So that is there. And of course they might even need more help. So here is examples with sentence frames, exemplars. And uh, also we pull out exemplars for all students um, at different later units when we really ramp up the expectations. And then here's the assessment. Here's that quiz on inversely proportional. The, a review day, we really want that big idea. Remember the four patterns at the exposure level, double stays the same. Double, the out, input doubles, output doubles. Proportional quadratic is input doubles, output quadruples because it's wider and taller. 
And then inversely proportional. There are some things that when you double one, the other thing halves or gets twice as wide, becomes twice as short, inversely proportional. All students can master that mathematical thinking. And then also the big idea that we can look at the world. What is physics? We look at the world, we take data, and we create a mathematical model that acts like that system so we can further investigate it. We didn't even talk about that. Like, why is the paragraph asymptotic and things like that? But there's a lot there in those data discussions that students will come up with. And that mathematical model brings up more questions when it's done in an understandable way. And then also we can predict the future behavior. So that's one of the biggest ideas in physics. And then we have our final task, which is the assessment. And that's that test. I did save. That's the right fit for your students with the key or patterns in your life with the student examples. If there, uh, we really suggest not taking an extension here. We really want to get to unit six. Uh, if you saw good stuff here, we have good stuff every unit. And unit six is climate change and building electric guitars. So there is an extension that's for many times is really used for students trying to get like an honors credit for a course or something like that, that are going above and beyond. Um, yeah. So pinhole camera, it's awesome. Really open-ended. They could ask many different questions and all four patterns show up depending on what question they ask. Here's an overview article if you want more.